This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Fraud is the intentional act uh, involving deception uh, to gain unjust or illegal advantage. There are two levels of fraud. There is, first of all, fraudulent financial reporting. Uh, for example, a board of directors uh, overstates profits uh, in the hope of uh, getting a good price, let's say, when the shares are sold, either to uh, the stock exchange on a flotation or to a company who wants to, to take them over, or they inflate the profits so the directors get a good bonus. So you have that uh, layer of fraud or level of fraud uh, on the financial statements. Uh, and then kind of... Uh, Below that, uh, you have fraud, which is really the misappropriation of assets, which is theft. Uh, employees stealing cash, inventory, uh, valuable uh, non-current assets, easy to move non-current assets like laptops. Uh, that is fraud, as is indeed uh, uh, perhaps filling in your overtime uh, incorrectly to boost your earnings. The uh, prevention and detection of fraud must be an integral part of corporate strategy. Uh, if uh, no uh, heed is paid to the possibility of fraud whatsoever, uh, frauds can end up being huge. Uh, and of course, particularly on fraudulent financial reporting, uh, there can be huge fallouts if uh, after uh, some years of a uh, fraudulent profits being reported, uh, there's found to be a great a hole in profits, great hole in reserves and cash flows and so on, then it can lead the company into liquidation uh, and huge suffering for all the uh, investors. Now, for fraud to be perpetrated, you need incentive, opportunity and attitude. So what are these incentive, opportunities and uh, attitudes? So incentives is really just the, the uh, uh, why are you going to commit fraud? Uh, and of course, it can be, uh, uh, if you like, just kind of pure, let me just go back to that, it can be pure greed. So here we have misappropriation of assets. Why would somebody uh, steal cash? Uh, it's, it's because of greed. They don't really need the money, they just see it there and they pick it up. It could be personal financial pressure. They have to pay their rent or the mortgage at the end of the month. They don't have enough to do that. Uh, they will have to pay off their credit card. Uh, and they are therefore incentivized, motivated to commit the fraud uh, because of those. It could be dislike of the uh, employer. So dislike of the employer, uh, you really want to get your own back on them. You want to uh, damage them really because of this dislike. In terms of fraudulent financial reporting, what might the motivation be? And to some extent, these are all falling into the same kind of area here. You have your directors. Directors don't like profits to ever fall. They certainly don't like dividends to fall. It's a kind of mark of failure. There's great pressure to perform and keep improving every year. Uh, and there may well be incentives and bonuses and share options uh, related to the re, uh, reported profits. Uh, and so directors are uh, at best motivated to give over-optimistic uh, uh, forecasts or over-optimistic views of the value of inventory and the recoverability of debts. Uh, but uh, then it goes from perhaps being too optimistic, moving along to out-and-out -out fraud. You need opportunity. So looking at the uh, misappropriation of assets uh, here, any business that's uh, a lot of cash uh, around the place, cash is obviously a very easy uh, item to kind of put in your pocket or move to your bank account. And of course, it's very useful. Uh, any uh, business with high value portable stock, like a jewellery business, uh, then it, it opens itself up to very easy fraud because these high value items are easy to conceal. Poor internal controls if nobody is really uh, uh, checking up on the, the cash that's banked for example, 
poor IT systems where you can get into the IT system without having to log on and then you can begin doing dodgy journal entries and so on is again an opportunity for committing fraud. At the higher level, fraudulent financial reporting. If there are many estimates, then it gives the directors leeway to perhaps overstate profits by understating provisions. Complex, trans <coughs> complex transactions that uh, maybe auditors and other members of the management team don't properly understand. A very dominant chief executive is an important one, and we come on to look at uh, corporate governance, we see a lot of it is to try to reduce the power of a dominant bullying chief executive uh, who may come in and say simply give me some petty cash or uh, write me this money for expenses without producing proper documentation that the expenses are uh, uh, proper uh, can get away with uh, murder really. Now we've all maybe been in situations where we've had a personal uh, financial pressure, where we see cash sitting around in our employer's office, but that doesn't mean we then go and commit fraud. The last part of the jigsaw is an attitude, uh, essentially a, a dishonest attitude, a lack of integrity really on a personal level. And so we can just be dishonest, uh, however we can be led into kind of dishonesty by, uh, for example, other people's attitude or other people's behaviour. Uh, if you see it seems to be part of the culture in your organisation uh, that other employees are over-claiming expenses, perhaps claiming first-class fares when really they're going on uh, standard-class fares, uh, if you see everyone else doing it then it's very easy to be sucked into that and you almost make yourself believe that, well, the employer must know about this anyhow. Poor ethical guidance can be in there as well, over uh, ways of overriding uh, existing controls. Again, perhaps fooling yourself, I'm doing this really for the good of the company, when really it's for your own personal benefit. Now, an anti-fraud strategy has three strands. First of all, uh, there is fraud prevention. And this can be simple physical methods like locking valuable inventory away. Uh, it, it can be making sure that cash is banked. It, it can be making sure that uh, uh, requests for purchasing uh, products are authorised and so on. These are all methods of trying to prevent fraud happening in the first place. Good surveillance is another method of prevention. Detection. So at the end of the day you make sure you add up the cash, you reconcile it to the till rolls and you can account for all of the, the, the cash. Uh, if there's a uh, cash missing then you have detected that a fraud has taken place. Uh, similarly uh, regular stock takes will allow you to detect that perhaps there has some uh, uh, theft taking place of uh, items of inventory. And then there is the response. And the response is as follows. Uh, first of all, how much has been defrauded? How long has it been going on for? How was it done? Because if you don't find out how it's done, you've got no hope of stopping it in the future. Who were the perpetrators? Who suffered losses, because sometimes fraud might be a fraud on a customer. Uh, if, if someone is trying to bill a customer for goods that were delivered and the like. It could be a fraud suffered by a shareholder uh, if you overstate what the profits are. How can it be prevented in future? And one of the things we need to think here in, in, in the response is kind of the action to take. What are we going to do about the fraudsters when we have discovered them? Are we just going to give them a stern warning? Are we going to sack them? Are we perhaps going to sack them with a good reference just to get rid of them quietly? And many companies prefer to sack fraudulent employers because it's rather embarrassing to admit that you have been suffered a fraud. 
are you going to call the police? Are you going to prosecute? Because again, that becomes a very public uh, um, theatre, really. Uh, and everyone knows that you have been uh, subject to a fraud. And sometimes it can be quite difficult to get enough evidence to pass the criminal uh, bar, if you like, uh, that will uh, find somebody guilty uh, uh, on beyond reasonable doubt. Bribery, corruption and whistleblowing. First of all, whistleblowing. This is making a disclosure, perhaps to regulatory authorities, uh, perhaps even to newspapers, uh, 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 in the public interest. So you're saying there's something going wrong here. In the UK, whistleblowers are given protection under the law, uh, provided the whistleblowing, this disclosure, is for a good purpose. It's not simply because you don't like your employer and you are uh, divulging stuff that might be just embarrassing. Uh, it has to be whistleblowing for a good purpose. For example, that there's a criminal offence. So if you know that the directors are overstating profit fraudulently, then you'll be given protection under the law uh, by making that known to the authorities. If somebody's health uh, or, or safety is in danger, it's obviously very important that you blow the whistle, if you like, perhaps to save injury or someone's life. If there's danger to the environment, so if you know that your company is releasing nasty poison into the local river, uh, you, you've, you've told them about it, but they say, well, it's cheap to do that, uh, then again, you'll be given protection under the law to reveal that. A miscarriage of justice, uh, someone has been maybe uh, fined, put in prison uh, for a fraud, but you know it wasn't them who did it, it was somebody else who did it, uh, that they didn't steal those items of inventory, somebody else did it, Again, you can blow the whistle. The company is breaking the law. Uh, and finally, if you believe that somebody is carrying up wrongdoing. But it must be done in good faith. You must really believe that this is one of these events is happening. Uh, you mustn't do it kind of trivially. You mustn't do it with that thought. Because if you make accusations and they turn out to be untrue, then of course you're damaging the company the investors and indeed the rest of the employees. So here we have uh, really what I said that the disclosure is to be made in good faith. You must believe or reasonable belief that the information is true uh, and that you're making the disclosure to the right person. So this means that you are not necessarily free just to go to the newspapers. Uh, you have to say, well, maybe first I will disclose it to further up within the organization. You know, the my boss's boss, if you like, if you want to blow the whistle on your boss, then maybe you take it to the order committee or, or you take it to the human resources department. Uh, if they don't uh, uh, pay any heed to your complaints, then maybe you consider going to regulatory authorities or the police. But you can't just necessarily immediately go to the highest possible level of authority. Bribery. Bribery is offering financial or other uh, advantages to someone to perform a relevant function or activity improperly. Uh, for example, awarding you a contract when you're not really the, the, the best uh, company to whom that contract should be uh, awarded or bribing someone to let goods leave the factory uh, which uh, are, really shouldn't be leaving the factory because they're never going to be paid for. It can be, it's in uh, public nature, it's uh, a business, it's in the course of uh, employment. So uh, bribery can be to a public official it can be in context with a business, it can be in a context of the course of your employment. The offences, uh, bribing another person. Secondly, receiving a bribe. Bribing a foreign public official. And finally, a commercial organisation which prevents to take reasonable steps to prevent bribery can be found guilty under the 
UK Bribery Act 2010, and the penalties are very substantial. They certainly go up to uh, terms in jail if you are found uh, guilty of one of these four offences. The six principles that uh, people should uh, have in force, and these are really the six principles uh, that we're looking for, for uh, trying to prevent bribery there, that a, an organisation has to take some steps to prevent bribery. And uh, these are the six principles. First of all, they have to be proportionate procedures. Uh, in other words, you, you look at the, the, the chance of bribery occurring, and if it's high, then you need good procedures, good checks, balances, reports, uh, and supervision to stop it. Uh, but if the chance of actually uh, perpetrating a bribe are very small because of the nature of your business, uh, then you don't need the, the, the same degree of diligence. It needs a commitment by management. Management must set out its stall and say, we are against bribery, even though it may allow our company to win lucrative contracts, we will not do that. It requires risk assessment. So in your company, you might uh, conclude there's very little chance of bribery in uh, sales, but there might be a very large chance of bribery in purchases and in trying to get purchase contracts uh, agreed. Other businesses will have it the, the other way around. They're desperate to make a sale, to win a contract. That's where the big bribery risk is. But in fact, on the other side, on, on purchasing, they're, they're, they're fairly happy that there's not going to be a great uh, potential for bribery there. Due diligence. Uh, we must uh, take reasonable care, uh, reasonable steps uh, in uh, set up and in progress to prevent bribery. We must communicate problems, we must communicate instances of where bribery has occurred. If you don't do that, you keep it secret, uh, then you run the risk of falling into the same trap in future years. And finally, monitoring and review. The first steps we've got in here may be fine now, but of course businesses grow, evolve, they change what they're doing, they begin operating in different spheres and in different countries, and the opportunities for bribery, either payment or receipt, kind of rise and fall, and we must keep under review the six principles. Company ethics. We've looked at professional ethics for uh, firms of accountants, but actually company ethics, an ethical company, is very, very important. The problem is that uh, if a company is acting unethically, you can be pretty sure it's going to be found out. Uh, whistleblowing has become more common. Uh, I, I think uh, social media, the internet, the ease with which uh, information can be copied and transmitted, uh, make it much more likely that unethical co conduct uh, will become publicly known. And once it becomes publicly known, then of course there's huge risk. Uh, there is risk uh, that you are going to, of course, damage your reputation. Uh, people get worried. They say you've been unethical on this. How many other skeletons are there in the cupboard? Things we, we don't know, but you've shown yourself to be an unethical company, an unethical person. What else are you up to? What, what else are we going to discover uh, that's going to be subject maybe to large fines and uh, legal penalties and so on. If there is less risk, if people trust the company, then by and large you're going to get cheaper finance because the cost of finance is intimately involved with the amount of risk. The higher the risk, the higher the cost of finance, whether it's raising loans or equity. Cheaper finance allows you to enjoy higher net present values and higher net present values boost the share price and therefore boost the wealth uh, of your investors. A pure reputation will put off uh, customers, uh, but may be a deterrent to 
recruiting good employees? Why would you choose to be employed by a an unethical, in a way unpleasant uh, company, if you had the choice of going to an ethical company? Why would you choose maybe to go into a joint venture uh, with an unethical company who may tarnish your reputation? At lower costs, costs coming from rectifying the damage that was done, uh, paying fines, perhaps even losing your right uh, to trade uh, if you require a license and this can be taken away from you in the light of unethical behaviour. To discover whether something is ethical or unethical, uh, something which has come new into the syllabus are Tucker's five questions. Uh, and companies and their management should answer, ask these five questions when they're considering uh, new ventures or making decisions. First of all, uh, is the uh, proposal, is the venture, is the opportunity profitable? If it's not profitable, you're arguably being a little bit unethical towards your investors. Secondly, is it legal? That should be fairly cut and dried. Uh, if you are not <coughs> confident it's legal, then for goodness sake, go and get legal advice. Don't, don't hope for the best. Is it fair? It's a difficult one. Uh, uh, so we could be thinking we're going to be you know, building a new factory and there are going to be winners and losers on that. Uh, the winners will be maybe local people who are going to get new employment. Uh, the losers might be uh, people who enjoy the countryside as it is or perhaps you're closing down an old factory, relocating to move to uh, uh, another area where you're opening your new factory. The losers are going to be the employees who are made redundant at the old factory, but of course there are opportunities in new factory. We can maybe make it fairer if you give decent uh, compensation to the people who've lost their jobs. But it's, it's always a tricky one to uh, decide. Is it right? <clears throat> very similar lines to is it fair but we're really getting down almost deep into our own consciousness uh, conscious uh, conscience here do we feel that it is right to do this despite what the profits might be despite what certain benefits might be and <clears throat> you needn't be surprised at different people who have got different views on that and finally uh, is it sustainable or environmentally sound uh, an awful lot of uh, ethical decisions now uh, will make reference to sustainability and uh, the effect on the environment and, and so on. Basically, we're saying that if something is not environmentally sound, it becomes harder and harder to justify that it is right. Of course, it depends on the size of the environmental damage. To some extent, almost anything we do has got some effects on the environment. But we have to get a balance. And is it sustainable? Uh, will this be a business or business opportunity that has got a long-term future? We don't want to be just going in somewhere, uh, extracting commodities over a couple of years and then just abandoning the plant. Uh, it is simply not sustainable, either as a profit-making uh, venture or for people's employment. Corporate uh, code of ethics. Many companies have uh, instituted these. Uh, they're drawn up and they are uh, distributed to uh, employees and indeed to management uh, as guidance on how to make proper ethical decisions. The sort of areas you'll be looking at will be equal opportunities, men, women, ageism, uh, different races and the like. Bullying of people should be forbidden at work. Use of the internet, what are you looking at on the internet, what sort of files are you downloading, what are you doing on the internet. We've talked about bribery, money laundering, taking dirty mon money and trying to make it clean and look respectable. There are certainly criminal sanctions involved in that. Uh, responses to conflicts of interest, how should we settle disputes uh, where maybe the customer thinks they've been badly done by, we think they've been fairly done by. What Do we have proper 
dispute resolutions mechanisms in place? And finally, what about if a product is dangerous or might be dangerous? Uh, what action should we take to, to recall that, repair it, uh, maybe to compensate people uh, who have been damaged by it? <clears throat> Corporate codes of practice uh, need emphasis on values. Um, it's impossible to cover every eventuality uh, and write down, you know, list upon list upon list of things which are wrong. You have to give people kind of guidance as to how to maybe make the ethical decision based on values. It requires management at the top to be really behind it and to really push it. It needs guidance to employees and in particular you really ought to give them some training. Some little workshops where you give them little scenarios and you discuss what would you do in this particular situation, what do we think is the right outcome from this. And of course, it's very good public relations, even if you're a little bit cynical about ethics, being able to say we're an ethical company and look, here's our ethical guide which sets it out, uh, at least makes people believe for a little while that maybe you're acting ethically. Ethical conflicts, uh, where customers disagree maybe with what you think is ethical, maybe within the organization, two different departments disagree with what is thought to be ethical. Very quickly, get the facts. Try to find out what are the ethical conflicts or principles involved here. Is it kind of comparing money uh, and wanting to make profit to maybe causing damage or selling products which, even if they don't cause damage, are not of the highest quality and so on? What are the related fundamental principles? Are we being unfair? Is it right? Is it dishonest? What are the internal procedures? Hopefully we have those set up uh, as a way maybe of uh, presenting this perhaps to the Audit Committee or some larger organisations will have an Ethics Committee and you can present the problem to them uh, uh, and they, they will come down with uh, maybe an adjudication. If you're not happy there, uh, then, you know, think maybe what are the alternative courses of action. Go to your boss's boss, as we said before. Maybe in relatively extreme situations, you need to whistleblow. And consider the consequences of each course of action. OK, I could whistleblow, but look, this is going to cause huge damage to the company and the employees. Uh, 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 suppliers and so on. You know, I'm right in a way, my, my ethical point is right, but will perhaps more damage be done uh, by going with my conscience than would be kind of almost swallowing my pride? Uh, a difficult decision indeed to be making. And finally, ethics and control systems. There are two uh, types or approaches to ethics, and indeed we'll see to corporate governance. You can have a compliance or rules-based approach, uh, which tries to set out lots of rules and procedures, forms to fill in, to sign off and so on, lots of supervision and the like, uh, for detecting breaches of ethics, uh, reporting it and having some, something done about it. The good thing about these is it is down in black and white what is allowed behaviour and what will happen if you uh, breach that. The disadvantage is, as I said before, it's very difficult to have a completely comprehensive list of all types of behaviour which may be unethical. The other approach is the integrity-based approach, where what you try to do is emphasise to people the importance of taking ethical decisions, uh, appeal to your own sense of morality, to your own conscience and so on, uh, and say it, you know, it's your responsibility for deciding whether something is ethical or not. Uh, as a company, our corporate culture will be that we will not like it if you do something which is unethical. 
Uh, and, and, and therefore, if you are in any doubt at all, then begin to discuss it. Uh, try to find a resolution with it, rather than trying to kind of sweep it under the carpet. Uh, and you know, we're all adults here. We should know what is ethical and what is not ethical. We should know the standards of behaviour which are expected by an organisation of our sort. What should our culture be?